and all the members of the Gokar Party. Okay, um, everyone, please have a seat. We are about to begin this event. Um, sebelumnya, Bapak Ibu, uh, di depan, di hadapan Bapak Ibu di meja masing-masing ada translator yang bisa digunakan. Translator tersebut tinggal diklik tombol tengah dengan nama PWR atau Power. Itu bisa digunakan untuk uh, uh, mem membantu uh, translating all the, uh, the discussions. Okay. Um, Bismillahirrohmanirrohim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Shalom May peace be upon us all Om Swastiastu Namo Buddhaya Greetings of virtue Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests And fellow knowledge seekers Good afternoon all Welcome to exclusive lecture Of Golkar Institute I'm Razi Akbar Sabardi Academic Manager of Gokar Institute, and I'm deeply honored and happy to be your host for this special public lecture event, especially seeing the brightest smile I've ever seen from all the Gokar, Gokar family today. I have no doubt that because that is because of the quick count result that we witnessed for the last two days in the, elect, the presidential and legislative election. So then, I would like to start by greeting and congratulating our chairman of the governing board of Golkar Institute and our chairman of Golkar Party, Dr. Insinyur Erlangga Hartarto, and then Secretary General of Golkar Party and also member of the Board of Trustee, Bapak Lodwig Fredis Paulus, Bapak Dito Ganinduto, the treasurer of the Golkar Party and the member of, par uh, member of the Board of Trustee of Golkar Institute, Deputy Chairman of the Golkar Party Expert Council, Professor Yudi Krishnandi, and all deputy chairman of Golkar Party who are also the member of Golkar Institute, Bapak Rizal Malarangeng, Bapak Erwin Aksa, Ibu Dr. Hetifah, oh, uh, not, I mean, Ridwan Kamil, and his wife, Ibu Atalia. The chairman, uh, and I would like to give a warm welcome to the chairman of the Golkar Institute Management Board, Bapak Dr. Aceh Hasan Chadzili. Also chairman of Golkar, of the Supervisory Board, Bapak Idris Laina, and all the members of Golkar Institute Management and Supervisory Board, and also for all of the local leaders from Golkar Party today. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I know you guys might be easy there. And all honorable guests here. I apologize. I apologize for not being able to mention one by one 
Because if I have to mention one by one, I will mention all of you because you guys all are important person here. Give us applause today. <laughs> today, we gather, we gather here to expand our horizon about winning the regional election on 2024. Exclusive lecture by David Plouffe. This event is organized by Golkar Institute, Indonesia's first school of government and public policy that was established by a political party. Before we begin, I would like to ask for the cooperation to all the participants here to silence your mobile phone or set them to vibrate mode. To start this event, let us begin by singing our national anthem and a symbol of our unity and pride, Indonesia Raya. Everyone, please stand in. Thank you. Please take your seat. Ladies and gentlemen, let us begin by hearing welcome remarks from our treasurer of Golkar Institute Management Board, representing, representing Pak Ace, Mr. Erwin Aksa. The floor is yours. Please welcome. Thank you, Rasi. Uh, it's supposed to be Mr. Aceh who should uh, welcome everybody. He's the, the chairman of the board. Maybe Mr. Aceh is still counting the, uh, the number, the votes. So, <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Excellency, our chairman uh, of Golkar, Mr. Erlanga, also coordinating economic minister. <laughs> Let's uh, give applause to Mr. Erlanga. Uh, Excellency Mr. Ludwig Paulus, our Secretary General. Excellency um, Pak Dito, our Treasury of the Golkar. Mr. Chichip, advisor to Golkar. Mr. Rizal, uh, is the Chief Strategist of Golkar, we call it. Yeah? Also, Wakil Ketua Dewan uh, Pembina uh, Golkar Institute. Um, also, uh, welcome David Plough to Jakarta and all the, uh, all the team who are coming to Jakarta. I would like to also welcome Mr. Uh, Ridwan Kamil, Mr. Samsuar, Mr. Mr. Ijek, uh, Teti, Pak Jaki, uh, and also Ambassador Pak Yudi, Pak Idris Laina. Uh, well, so everybody's uh, from uh, Dewan Pakar, uh, TKN, uh, Tovan Pawe, and everybody who are here. Uh, it is my pleasure on behalf of Golkar Institute to again to welcome everyone in this exclusive lecture by Mr. David 
uh, Plough on winning the election on 2024 regional election or Pilkada on the horizon. So we are not sleeping yet. We are one more election to go, which is Pilkada. Uh, David is uh, most well known as campaign manager and chief of staff of US President Barack Obama. He has extensive experience with election all over the world. And today we want to learn from his experience and how he sees the Indonesia election. Allow me also introduce Golkar Institute. We were established in 2020 based on mandate from Golkar Party National Convention. We want to create a training platform for Indonesian uh, promising young political leaders, not just from Golkar Party, but from all over Indonesia, regardless of their background. So far, Golkar Institute has conducted 14 badges of the executive education program for young political leaders. Our president-elect for 2024 to 2029, Pak Prabowo Subianto, delivered lecture for us in August 2023. In two and a half years, Golkar Institute has 500 more alumni. They are spread across the country, 185 of of them competed in legislative election of 2024. They're young, smart, high capacity, and have excellent leadership. We hope many of them get legislative seats in the 2024 election. We, we will be conducting the 15th batch of our training on 26 February 2024, just two weeks after our general election because we believe political education must continue on. Golkar Institute conduct many public lectures and public dialogue on various topics. We would like to thank Mr. David Plough for making the time for to come to Indonesia and deliver this lecture. I hope we all have a productive and inspiration session today. And thank you again for coming. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, so, sorry to forget also Mr. Acho from South Sulawesi, next uh, also leader in South Sulawesi and Mr. Tovan Pawe. <laughs> so we have two best leaders from South Sulawesi are coming here. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Mr. Irwin for your welcome remarks. Your insights are greatly appreciated. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the privilege to hear welcome remarks from our one and only chairman of the governing board of Golkar Institute and also the chairman of Golkar Party, His Excellency Dr. Honoris Causa Erlangga Hartarto. Please join me in welcoming Bapak Erlangga Hartarto. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua Terima kasih Pak Razi I need to speak in bahasa first Since the majority is bahasa Saya ingin berterima kasih Kepada Pak Sekjen, Pak Ludwig Paulus Bendahara Umum Pak Dito Ganindito, Senior Golkar Pak Cicip Sutarjo, kemudian dari Golkar Institute juga Pak Aceh Hasan Sajili, sekaligus kita beri tepuk tangan keberhasilan Golkar di Jawa Barat. Dengan co-captain Gubernur Ridwan Kamil. Dan welcome Bu Cinta to DPR. Saya juga berterima kasih Pak Ijek, Sumatera Utara. Golkar nomor satu di Sumatera Utara. 
Jadi Pak Ijek pantas jadi gubernur. Kemudian Pak Samsuar, Golkar 4 kursi, selamat, terima kasih. Kemudian Pak Tofan Pawe, Golkar win again di Sulawesi Selatan. Kemudian juga hadir di sini Ibu Airin, selamat. Golkar juga mudah-mudahan kursinya nambah. Ya. Ibu Teti, jadi kalau Pak Prabowo menang di Sulawesi Utara karena Golkar. Yang lain saya no komen dulu. <laughs> Pak Zaki. Pak Rian Norsan. Pak Ahmad Mus. Kemudian Ibu Putri. Dapilnya aman. Ibu Kristina. Mewakili DKI, The New Dynasty of Golkar, Buya Idris Laina, Riau Aman, Jakarta lagi, meng, Bekasi lagi menghitung, Profesor Yudi Kristandi, anggota DPR, kembali comeback to Senayan, Pak Dubes, kemudian di sini hadir juga, siapa yang belum kesebut nih? Pak Cicip sudah. Ternyata banyak pendukung juga Pak Cicip. Dari TKN, Pak Cul Malarangeng. Mana Pak Cul? Oh, nggak ikut ya? Oh ya Pak Nurdin Halid. Ini kembali ke Sulawesi, kembali ke Senayan. Kemudian Pak Mulia Amri ada, ini luar biasa. Kemudian Pak Diko Ganindito, ya. Kemudian ada lagi yang belum? Sudah ya. Kemudian ada lagi yang lain? Yang belum, Bengkulu, Bengkulu ini luar biasa Pak Gubernur, dua kursi dari empat. Terima kasih Pak Roydin, ini luar biasa, top. Dan seluruh yang tidak dapat saya sebut dan yang utama tamu kita Mr. David Plow. Tidak banyak yang saya ingin sampaikan. First, I would like to thank you for all the support of Golkar and all the Golkar Institute. That what we achieve today, it is import, it is impossible without the collaboration and cooperation of all of us. Our candidate, President and Vice President, Pak Prabowo dan Mas Gibran, win the election landslide. So this is also a remarkable achievement that we work so hard in the last couple of months. We have to remember that when we decide to nominate President hopeful Pak Prabowo and Mas Gibran, We are not in the pole position. Prabowo was on the second seat below Ganjar and a little bit ahead of Anis. The Golkar decision changed the landscape. And since Golkar decisions, there is only one way. 
draft that is going up for Prabowo and Gibran. For Golkar, I do understand that some of us are doubtful. Even some of our colleague is not with us. Wait and watch. But our determinations, our willing to win, and thank you for all the head of Golkar province. I would like to salute all of you. Thank you. And our candidates are extraordinary. Last night, when the president asked, what is the reason that Golkar can win this time? So we have discussions, and one thing that I appreciate that Golkar are the one and only party that is thankful to our president that we have been doing this together. So that make the change. So now we have one more chance and one more way going forward that we have to keep outside low profile but in the meantime, we have to work hard that the vote is translated to the seat in the parliament. And one more time, I urge all DPD, Ketua Ketua DPD, dan juga Caleg untuk secure the seat so our seat will be the highest in the parliament. So I ask, but there is no media here, right? This is not for public. I want to see the chairman, the speaker of the house is from Golkar. And the Golkar Institute and Mr. David Plo will have a new theory, the theory of the reverse Kotel effect. I would like you to think and how we can use this for 2029 election. If and only if that our calculations of number of seats that we exercise that is below 105, before, little bit above 105, it means that our vote in parliament is already around 17.5%. So that's remarkable. I would like to thank you. And David, please. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please have a seat. Please have a seat first. Thank you so much, Bapak Erlangga Hartarto, for your welcome remarks. Your insights are greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, now we have to come to our main agenda, the exclusive lecture session of Gokar Institute. And got us to this enlightening discourse, I would like to invite and introduce our moderator for today's session, which is his prominent Indonesian political scientist, politician, and prolific writer, Dr. Rizal Malarangeng, please welcome and give him applause. Okay, uh, the session is about to begin. I give the floor to Dr. Rizal Malarangeng. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to this very important day. It's a sweet day for Golkar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Pa Erwin, Pa Acha, everybody. Uh, before you, sir, you have mover and shaker of Indonesian politics that needs no introduction. Uh, before we begin, uh, this is not exactly a lecture. 
because nobody can lecture uh, the gentleman, <laughs> uh, the real politicians of Golkar. Maybe it's a kind of discussion started by you uh, and then deepened by, by the forum with question and answer. But before, I would like to start by thanking Mr. Chairman, uh, as he said before. Uh, this is history for Golkar because for the first time in our history after Reformation, after 2004, after three elections, the first time for Golkar parties to see the seats rise again. So it's a rebound history for Golkar. Maybe it is, it is, a not, it is not enough with only appreciation as normal. I would love to ask all of you to arise and give standing ovation to the chairman. Please do rise from your seat and give standing ovation to Pa Erlaga. For, thank you, Pa Erlaga, for, for a successful party. But, well, you maybe know more. You need good politicians. You need good grassroots, but you also need good leadership. So you have to have all these elements, and luckily this time, we have it. That's, that's the key of the success. Now, David Plouffe does not need further introduction. He is the chairman of the Obama campaign in 2008. He made history then, like we are making history now. He made history by introducing into the campaign modern way of doing things with the internet. We all remember, we all love Obama, David. Well, I happen to live very close by to the elementary state school where he went to in Menteng. And he has a very small statue, but very interesting statue of him there even today. So we love Obama. That means we love you too. That's why we, <laughs> that's why we love to hear and learn from your experience you share with us the essence of modern campaigning. Because we have, well, maybe not now, but Pa Erwin and Golkar has started with the artificial intelligence applied in the campaign. But five years from now, it becomes international news. New York Times, ABC News from Australia wrote about it, how AI campaigning in Indonesia changed the election. I don't know whether it's true or not, but we have started it. But we can imagine five years to 10 years from now. But I think the essence of campaigning since the ancient times of Pericles in Athens until today in Jakarta and in America will never change. How to persuade the people to follow whatever you think is best for a country, right? But the method is different according to the advancement of technology, of the changing of society, many things else. Now we want to learn from you the modern, the essence of a good modern campaigning. This is not the last day for us. It's a happy day. It's a very sweet day. But we are going to have our next local election in September. We are going to have September. Maybe. November, but it might be, it might be, it might be changed to September. But I don't, I don't know. What I mean is that, <laughs> what I'm saying is that the election today does not stop here. Right? <clears throat> so we want to learn. We want to learn, we want to study, we want to discuss with our friends. And hence we have Gold Card Institute. An institute where we can discuss discuss things that are important in politics without being too close, right? With uh, some kind of distance we want to study. So uh, without much further ado, we invite you to give us the lessons of politics that you have uh, already experienced from all over the world. We know that you don't only advise Obama, but you advise a lot of presidents, you advise a lot of uh, congressmen and women. And from your point of view, what is the most important lesson in politics and modern campaigning? So maybe we can share also with you our thoughts about that after that. Of Please course. do, David. Well, I've been in politics long enough to know that no 
you don't want to give a lecture to people who just won uh, a really important election. So uh, I should be listening to, to you. And, and congratulations, Mr. Chairman, and all of you um, to have that kind of result, obviously. After many years where you went down, you come up, you had the biggest gain of any party is a remarkable thing. And what I've learned in politics is it's oftentimes when you have a bad election, it's easy to get people to say, well, let's examine what went wrong and we've got to try and fix it. It's just as important you have a good election to ask those same questions, both what went right, but you can never be satisfied. Uh, I'm sure most of you know who the per Michael Jordan is. He's a famous basketball player, right? Uh, and he was very competitive. And so if he went into the locker room at halftime and his team was up by 10 points, he would be furious and ask, why aren't we up by 16? And in my view, in politics, you always have to be thinking, even when you do well, how can we do better? And I think you're still counting votes. You're still going to have to decide in this country how seats gets allocated. But there's a lot of questions, which is, from my standpoint, and you guys are much more closely following this than I am and involved in it, but one, you know, which voters came to you in this election and why? And can you get them in 24 and 29? And of course, we live in a world of sophisticated data. So if that 2 to 3% of voters in the country there's probably another 6 to 8% just like them, demographically, educationally, age-wise. So in politics, in my view, you're always trying to limit the number of voters. That, that sounds bad. Of course, you want everybody to vote for you, but that's not realistic. So how do you really have a realistic target of we think these people are open to our party and our candidates? Uh, you know, the chairman mentioned this wasn't just where the coattails go. There was reverse coattails, as we talked about at lunch. Why did that happen? Why did some parties struggle? So I think this is where the, the Golkar Institute and others, in my humble opinion, need to do sophisticated. We, all of you have your view of what happened. And by the way, a lot of you are probably right. But what I've learned is in politics, the people who are practitioners are the last people that should decide what happened. You need to go listen to the voters and listen and then learn from that and understand how do you build on the success for the elections that are coming up later this year. And of course, uh, you're already thinking about the one to come in five years from now. How do you position yourself? Um, you know, I think the other, you're right, politics hasn't changed. Of course, AI and sophisticated data, platforms like TikTok, I'm sure by 29, there'll be another platform or two uh, that are gonna be really important. But at the end of the day, whether it's 2,000 years ago or 20 years ago or today, it is quality of candidate, in your case as a party, candidates. And I think what you're going to find in this election, my suspicion is that voters were much more than they had previously dialed in on candidates, not just party. Quality of candidate. That's their biography. Do they have an interesting background? Can they connect with voters? Will they work hard? <laughs> Will they raise the resources? I have seen, and in some cases, worked for candidates who looked amazing on paper, and they were terrible candidates. I'll take a hard worker any day over someone who looks good on paper. You gotta hustle. And connected to that is message, meaning, what's your story? Why are you doing this? Who are you doing it for? How are your ideas gonna improve their lives? And then when you have a good message, which is hard enough, I think a lot of times we don't pay attention to who the messenger is. Now, candidates can be messengers, but we live in a world where anybody can take out their phone and reach the hundreds, thousands, sometimes even millions of people. A citizen can be a messenger. We have influencers on all these social media platforms. And so if you can get those people motivated, you basically increase your megaphone. And so, it's really important, I think, to think about the basics, but coming out of an election like this, you really want to spend some time and some money and get some sophisticated help to understand what happened here and how can we build on that. Um, and I think that if the election does get moved up, it's before the new president will get uh, installed in office, so that election may not be a reaction to that, but you also know that people in politics are not static. 
So you can't assume that the same way you run this race, although there's going to be fundamentals that are important, is the same way you should run a race even just six months from now. Things change very dramatically. And the best way to understand that is to make sure you're listening very carefully to the voters. Um, you know, the other thing I'd offer, and I think your party clearly did a good job of this, but just make sure you know exactly how every voter that you think is open to you is getting information. And construct a campaign reverses from that. I, I still see in our country a lot of people think politics is a television interview or speech they give. That's the wrong way to think. I think today if you are a company, I mean, you can learn a lot from the private sector. Private sector doesn't spend a second not thinking about how to communicate and how to convert. And so if you've got 100 voters and, you know, 10 of them primarily are on TikTok and 20 are on Instagram and some are on X and some do local news, that's how you need to construct your campaign. And I think we live in a world, and I think your campaign proved this, it's a visual first world. And I think that's hard for people who are engaged in politics. We think, I know I do, you know, a policy paper. Let me explain my policy. You know, let me think about the speech I'd give. And that's important, but I think you have to think picture first. And I can say I wish the world wasn't that way, but it is the way it is. If you can't communicate something with a picture and a couple of words, a meme, or a two or three second video in today's world, you might as well not communicate it in my view. Now that doesn't mean that you, you can still give a 30 minute speech, you can still give an interview, but that's part of something that flows from that visual first way of thinking about politics. You know this because you haven't had the momentum you'd like after recent elections. When parties have momentum, you have to seize that because it won't last forever. It's gonna help you recruit candidates. It's gonna help you recruit volunteers. It'll help you recruit talent in the data world, the AI world, the content world. So my, in my humble opinion, use this moment because you're a magnet now. You're on the rise. You've got the best story coming out of this election. And that's a moment where everybody from a voter to a potential staffer to a potential candidate is listening to you. Um, and so I don't want to lecture much because, again, you all just had a great election. You've won a lot more recent election than I have. And we but are still counting the votes, too. You're still counting the votes. Um, but, you know, my, you know, my, it's hard because you should celebrate. You should be happy. You should, it's really important, I actually think, in politics to take a moment to appreciate what you accomplished. But you can only do that for like 30 seconds. <laughs> you you got to keep going because when you have a good election, now, in our country, in the United States, we're two parties. If my party has a good election, I know there's people just as smart or smarter than I am spending a lot of time thinking, how do I erase their advantage on content, on data, you know, on uh, social media, on candidate quality? In this country, you've got more than one party, and they, you have a target now. They're all thinking, how can we eliminate their advantage? You might do it more nicely here than we do. In our country, you kind of want to de decapitate the other side. But that's what's happening. So, you, you know, good organizations, whether they be NGOs or the private sector, the best CEOs will tell you, they spend most of their time figuring out how to reinvent themselves to basically get involved in creative destruction. So carry forward from this election, work well and build from it, but don't be satisfied. Right? Because it's a race. You know, it's a race to grow your support, but it's also a race against these other parties who are saying, we've got some real work to do. Um, and so that's the lesson I've learned is politics in this world changes so quickly. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not, I think, marked by decades anymore, or even years, or sometimes even months, right? But I think that my sense is, I'm not a big fan of talking about process. Like, you should talk about what you want to do for the people and why that's important. But you guys just did have a good election. So I think you might want to think about some public storytelling about why that was. Who are the voters that came to Goldtar? Who are those great candidates that made it happen? Uh, so that you capture that momentum. It's a very powerful thing in politics. Um, and you can lose it very quickly. The other thing is, 
you know, you have some parties that didn't do particularly well. And so, you know, you also have to think, how do you continue that trend <laughs> so they do not, you know, bounce back as quickly as possible? Uh, this is a competitive exercise after all. But, but I just want to congratulate you. I, I, by the way, loved your uh, quick count. I just loved your quick count. Uh, I, I watched it all day yeah. long, all night. <laughs> uh, In I'm America, there is no quick count. Your quick count. Um, it actually is amazing to see how accurate it ended up being, that people trusted it, that even though you have votes to count and actual seats yeah. still to be determined, um, it gives people some certainty. And, and in my country, as you know right now, our elections are quite fraught. Um, and I think if we had something like the quick count, it would go a long way to removing <laughs> a little bit of uh, our next election is going to be the same one as the last. It's going to be a at least a week, maybe two months of, uh, of, of democracy uh, challenging moments. But the quick count to me was a great uh, innovation. So that has nothing to do with Golkar. Uh, but boy, I love seeing it in person. So let's get into discussion. All right. David, first of yeah. all, you talk very well. <laughs> Why don't you become a politician too? Uh, I don't think I'd pass the vetting. All right. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, I'm, excuse me if I take this privilege as a moderator to ask the first question, David. <laughs> uh, uh, from your experience, and you've you know, uh, talked about Indonesia, you witnessed the election two days ago, right? Now, just your take, from your personal take, something maybe before study deeply, uh, what would be the answer of what we discussed before with the chairman too? The biggest question in this election you know, we have three parties, the three biggest parties, PDIP, uh, Golkar, and Greenra. But among these three parties, two of them are going down in terms of the number of uh, votes according to the quick card, right? But only Golkar uh, that has seen the numbers increase, most likely by a very significant amount of uh, degree, yeah? Let's say 3% to 4%. Translate into seats. Uh, one percent of the votes translate into four, uh, five point eight seats in the parliament. So that means three to four, meaning about twenty to twenty-five, at least fifteen seats in the parliament, which is a very significant amount. The question is why. What, what happened? Is it something deeper, or something uh, related to the mood and the uh, presidential uh, right. dynamics that we call the disappearance of the cocktail effect at this time. Before it happened, but now it doesn't happen. What is the experience around the world or your personal take? I know it requires a deeper study. That's Golkar Institute. Next assignment, yeah? And it's very good for students of Politik Razi to write a dis PhD dissertation on this question, answering this question. What happened? in election in Indonesia 2024. Please, David. Well, I, it's going to sound like I'm dodging the question, but I've learned that um, you really need to do professional research with professional researchers with the voters to answer that question. It's very dangerous for candidates or party leaders or staff to assume they know the answer to anything unless you go out to the market, which is the voters, okay? By the way, like in Irwin Ox's district, I think it was almost a 9% increase over the last election. So that's, a, so that's worth studying what happened there. Who are those voters? So what all I have is questions, right? Because the, the gap between what the presidential top of the ticket got and his party got was 40 points. 40. It's a huge gap. So I think... It has to be in some areas that you had better candidates than the other parties had. This may not be true. It may be that you benefited in this election, surprisingly, by not having a candidate at the top of the ticket, where voters said, you know, they are part of a coalition, but they seem a little more independent than everybody else. That tends to be what I've seen in elections through the years is uh, you can make a lot of progress if voters think that you are the fairest arbiter at that moment. Um, so those are my two main questions I'd have. Um, but there could be deeper things going on. 
And um, I think that this, uh, of all the things that you will do over the next 60 days, in my humble opinion, the most important thing is to get as close as possible to answers you trust so that then you can plan and operationalize off that. It's like having better intelligence in a war than your opposition, okay? And so I think when you find out what happened, I would also encourage you not to share that with anybody. <laughs> that is very valuable intellectual property. You need to operationalize it. Uh, because again, you know, you're not after 40% of the vote or 50% of the vote, at least in most places. So if you can go from 17 to 20 or 17 to 22, that's a huge difference. And you're not talking about at the end of the day, think about that, it's not that many people. Sometimes I think we overcomplicate politics. You know, how many people are gonna vote and you know, you've got a spread out country. If you're talking about the number of people that will actually make a difference in the next election and then the one in 29, it's a small number of people. So construct, now, that doesn't mean you, won't, you don't wanna be overly cautious because sometimes you have a great candidate who can win voters that surprises people. But generally you wanna have a very good sense of who's available to you. Right? So I know in our country, we have a big national election, but it's kind of decided at the state level. Our presidential race will be decided by two million voters tops. That's it, that's the entire campaign. And you better not forget that. That's all it is. The messaging, the method of reaching those people, how to motivate them, who the messengers are. So the most important thing I think is to understand, obviously what happened with uh, Garindra, um, why did you guys do better? Who are those voters? Uh, and what was the dynamic? But also understand the next election does not have at the top of the ticket. So that's the other thing I'd really interrogate voters for is, is anything gonna change because you don't have the top of the ticket? The top of the ticket's gonna be uh, candidates for governor. And so I just think that uh, I have a lot more questions and answers. The good thing is, if you do this process properly, you can get to the answer. And the answer is just the opportunity to do better in the next election. If you're doing it based on sound data analysis and a very good sense of who is the next cohort of voters that your party and your candidates can acquire uh, as voters. Right. So David, if you happen to meet young bright students in the US when you are back, and they want to study comparative politics or electoral politics in Indonesia, you can ask him to write a dissertation or her to study Golkar in yeah. Jakarta for the election. Maybe you will come with good dissertation. They will. <laughs> who knows? If the election goes a certain way, we may not have a democracy anymore. So everyone who cares about democracy will come here. By the way, I, I will make that point. This is not about your party. Okay? But I, maybe more than I believe in anything in the world, I believe in a strong democracy and what it means for people. And obviously in India, we see some moving away from that. Our country's threatened, there are many Western European. I think Indonesia, and this is gonna sound arrogant given where my country is, but I do think you have the opportunity because there's questions about are you guys backsliding? My evidence from being yeah. here on election day was you're not. But how do you strengthen that? You, you could become the most Shining strongest example yes. in the world. Yes. You know? Now, before I give it to the floor, I just emphasize one thing. Golkar Party is almost the only party in the world which in the past has very long history in authoritarian regime, but is successful in transforming itself into becoming an element of democratic uh, government. So what we see here is a kind of continuation of tradition where the country grows, becoming more stable and mature democracy. That's the proof. And these gentlemen and ladies, they are the living proof that politicians in Indonesia are the supporters of a strong democracy and their government. Well, you are commonly referred to as in the Western media, as the third largest democracy in the world. But actually, you have the biggest same day vote of any country in the world. And if my math is correct, your president elect 
received more votes for president than anyone than Joe Biden. in the history of the world. In all the history of the world. <laughs> yeah, the, thir uh, the turnout was 82%. Yeah. Uh, this election in the United States usually it's about 60 percent. So, in terms of participation, democracy, Indonesia is 20 percent more than it is in the United States. Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, now we invite. Uh, maybe uh, you want to ask question or some provide some kind of deeper insights of what is it that uh, we are uh, discussing uh, today. Pak Rasi, prepare the mic. Yes, sir. Maybe Anyone we give it to, like to give a question? Please rise Pak Erwin hand. or Pak Aceh first. As the... If you want to ask in Bahasa, it's okay, I can, I can do the translation. The ambassador, Pak Yudi, Professor Yudi is the former ambassador to Ukraine. Thank you for your service. Please, Pak. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, this is a fundamental uh, history of your country and also to our uh, political history in Indonesia. What's your view about, in America, you have two parties, right? Democrat and Republicans. And most of the time, Indonesian sees your country is a model democracy, a very solid, stable uh, democracy with only two parties. While in Indonesia, as a young uh, democracy, we have so many, yeah, more than 15, sometimes 20. Uh, what's your view uh, regarding these two different numbers of party in terms of uh, political stability and uh, for long term? Uh, political future for for us in Indonesia. Thank you. Well, Ridwan, I think that's a really important question. I, I um, so I have been a law, lifelong member of the Democratic Party, one of our two parties. So I don't say this lightly, but this two-party system in our country is not going to withstand too much more time. I think young voters, in particular, want more choices. And at the end of the day. I would argue that there's probably three Republican parties within one Republican party and at least two Democratic parties. So, so honestly, there'd be five to six parties naturally. And so I think that, um, and by the way, I think it's healthy to give voters as many choices as possible. The other thing I think is healthy is, uh, and this is not just unique to your country, we see it in other parts of the world as well, New parties emerge. Sometimes new parties emerge and they rocket and elect leaders and prime ministers. We've seen that in Italy and we've seen that uh, in other countries. So I generally think, um, uh, and I see in our country with voters, I mean, they are so fed up. Not all of them, some are very happy, but a lot of them are fed up. I'd say 70% of our country is fed up with the fact that these are the choices they have. Now, it's colored a little bit, and listen, I'm a big fan of our current president, but a lot of voters are dissatisfied with the geriatric cage match that we're about ready to present to the world. And they would like other choices. So I think that there's a lot to be proud of in terms of the rule of law and the way we've conducted elections in America. But I think that at the end of the day, my sense is countries that have more parties with all the mess that that provides, uh, is is better, and I think eventually in my country, I don't know if we'll soon have more legitimate parties or just more legitimate independent candidates. I, I'm almost sure we're going to have the latter, but I think that's particularly what young people are hungering for. So uh, what we've learned, of course, democracy is messy, uh, and it's under constant attack, um, and there's always folks in any country who would prefer the voters to have less say than they do. You know, that's certainly happening in well, probably 40% of the voters in my country right now. If you said the next 20 years will be Donald Trump, then Donald Trump Jr., then Ivanka Trump, and then Barron Trump, they'd say, great. I mean, that's pretty scary for a country that prides itself on its democracy. But we're just in a moment of threat. I think we'll be okay. 
But I think part of the reason it's weak is voters, particularly young voters, don't feel like either party is sort of answering their needs. And I mean, I know on some issues, I don't fit neatly into my party, right? And so and I think that's particularly true for young voters. And the Republican Party in my country is fascinating. It really is like three different parties. And they're, they're, they're uneasily held together. Um, so, so that's my sense. Uh, I, I know that there's challenge to systems where there's a lot of, particularly, you know, you're not a parliamentary system. Um, and so it's quite unique that you have this many parties in this current system with a direct election for president. But I think at the end of the day, it provides more options for voters to find homes. It also almost necessitates the building of coalitions. And, you know, that can be super frustrating, as you know, but I think it's pretty healthy. You know, I think in America today, it's more like tribal warfare, and there's not as much interest in building coalitions. So that's my sense of it. Um, but again, I think, listen, I hope we come out the other side and we're still directly electing people and our Supreme Court is not, uh, and our military is not usurped. And, you know, I think that's an open question, sadly. But but even if we come out okay, I still think, I really do think Indonesia has an amazing opportunity to, to set a standard, but not just the democracy you have today. I think that's one of the problems in our country is we, we kind of got complacent, like it was always gonna be okay. And then you realize when it comes under threat, it's not as strong as you thought it was, you know? And we see this all around the globe. It's generally powerful male narcissists who decide that the power they have is not enough. And that's super dangerous. And um, so I think, you have, I think you have a chance to say, okay, what else could we do here to strengthen rule of law, strengthen democracy, as it is under attack everywhere else? Because again, your voter turnout is remarkable. The way people, and I know there's claims of fraud here, but it's not, it's not widespread. I mean, it's a remarkable thing to witness, quite frankly. It inspired me uh, and reminded me of how it should be. So that's my sense, is there's a lot of benefit to multi-party systems and, and even systems where parties come and go uh, and new entrants come in. I, I think we need to, we need to welcome that. Um, so, and I think, you know, there, you know, you have rules here around who can directly nominate a president. And I, my sense is all those things ought to be examined. Like, we, we, just as we have to reinvent ourselves as organizations or parties or companies, I think countries also need to do that. Um, and um, I, think, I think the monopoly that we have in the United States is deeply dissatisfying to our voters. Um, and it's gonna take a lot of courage for both the voters themselves, but more independent mining candidates to come out. Because even though people complain, the number of people in America that are truly an undecided swing voter, like they could go from one party to another, is at most 5%. So 95% of the people are almost, as a matter of faith, gonna vote for one party or the other, even though they're frustrated. It's become very tribal. So that's the other thing. I think when you have more parties and more candidates, it keeps the number of people that are kind of at play in any election larger, and that's super important because that means candidates and parties need to appeal to the center of the electorate. And that's one of the things that's challenging our democracy and a lot of democracies in Western Europe is very, very few candidates have to worry about the center of the electorate. They're appealing to the most strident voices. And that's super dangerous. Right. That's the, that's the lucky of us also. The, the fortunate thing in Indonesia is that because everybody tries to go to the center where most voters are, right? We don't go, we don't play the militant cards. Rarely people with militant cards win. That's the, that's the key also. For your info, now there, there is a nine, nine parties in our parliament. But according to the quick count, it might be that it's going to be uh, eight parties uh, left, uh, which is part, uh, maybe quite representative of all the differences in Indonesia. In Indonesia. You can separate them. You know, nationalist or secular or uh, Islamist, but basically the pattern of uh, representativeness is quite uh, satisfying, uh, represented by these remaining eight major parties in the country. Uh, 
Oke, okay, uh, kalau Pak, boleh mereply sedikit. Yeah, oh, please, please, yeah. Pak. David, uh, uh, thank you for the answer. Ya, yeah. uh, my personal uh, uh, question that I always looking for an answer is whether Indonesian democracy is the right way. Yeah, because our nation goals is to to have a, a just and prosperity ya yeah. adil makmur kalau bahasa Indonesia because I compare the non-democratic nations like China Saudi Arabia for example they are, new, they, they, are, they are not choosing democracy but seems the prosperity are faster reflecting to yeah. my time as a governor I can perform only 60% of my vision because yeah. dealing with the parliament is not easy yeah. I have to discount so many uh, program, for example. So that's the challenge. Yeah, uh, if for sure. I had given the the more absolute power, maybe the progress <laughs> of West Java could be superb. Yeah, within 60% of my power, I won award almost 500 uh, within five years. So, so my point is, that's also one evaluation. Hopefully, Goskar Institute can have some. Uh, uh, evaluations uh, from you uh, in the future whether Indonesian democracy is, is on the right way as right. a choice. And last point is you have to understand we are very addicted to democracy. Almost 80,000 election, David, yeah? presidential election, parliament election in the national level, uh, parliament election in provincial level, parliament election in the city level, village. We have village like rural, 80,000 rural, they have also election, yeah. Uh, one man, one vote also. And also sometimes in the neighborhood units, only like 20 houses or 30 houses, they have also election for RT RW, for example, yeah. So it's very <laughs> expensive. <laughs> yeah. It's very intensive also. But I'm just hoping uh, from Golkar Institute and you in the future can have some sort of uh, you know, a few evaluation whether Indonesia is in the right way yeah. to use this one man, one foot democracy. That's well, my, my reply. Thank right. you. Just quickly, Ridwan, I think on the last point, it seems like it would be, and, may, and maybe you've already done it as a country and rejected it, but I would certainly look at that and say, would it make more sense to have fewer elections and combine them? Because voters do get weary of elections. It's, and it's very expensive. So I think um, that's part of a healthy democracy, I think, is looking at, okay, this is the way we've done things. Uh, could it be improved? And it may be that some combination makes some sense. I certainly, as a practitioner, know that that makes it less complicated for voters. It costs the state less money. Um, and I think when there's just always elections, sometimes the politics becomes more important than the governing. So. Now, you may say that's crazy, but I would at least examine it. On your first point, yes, uh, you know, and I used to work in government because I've spent a lot of time in government, not just in politics. Yeah, sometimes you look at what China's doing and Russia's doing and Saudi Arabia's doing, and, you know, you can be kind of envious. But that's the tax of democracy. Like, you almost have, a, have to have a belief that, yes, even if you could build all the high-speed rail you wanted, even if you could demolish family housing to go vertical with more apartments. Even if you could, um, you know, uh, have less dissent and you can quicken decision time. All that may seem great and there's some benefits to it, but you just have this fundamental belief that self-governance is worth the friction and price you pay. Um, listen, when I, when I have spent time in our government and like the most basic things aren't getting done, yeah, of course you're like, you know, is this system still working where you see what China's doing? Now, let's not overstate their position. They have massive economic problems, societal problems. They've got a huge problem with young, like, it's not all nirvana. But leaders can say, this is what I want to do, and they don't have to have a vote, and they don't have to deliberate. So I understand the appeal of that. But at the end of the day, as messy as democracy is, as messy as self-governance is, as messy as coalitions are, yeah, I think you're right. There's a big tax. And by the way, 
that is a reason sometimes, you know, people just like you with your talent decide not to run because they're frustrated because they say, I know what I'd like to do as a member of the parliament or as a governor or a mayor, but it's messy. I know in America, I've probably had a, well, I don't want to overstate it, but probably at least 100 conversations with people through the years who would have been remarkable candidates from the private sector or the public sector, and they say, no, because it's just too messy. I think we need to do this. I won't be able to get that done. So you're absolutely right. There's a bunch of prices we pay for this. Um, that's why, by the way, I think it's really important to celebrate the victories policy-wise. Uh, I know I have not done a good, good enough job. It's a simple thing to do. You run for office and you win. You said, here's the three things I'm gonna try and get done. And when you get them done, sometimes you talk to the press about them. Report back to the voters and say, remember back in the campaign I said that we were gonna do this? I got this done, thank you. Like, we, I've done such a terrible job of that through the years. Like, they're your stakeholders, right? But what that does is give people some confidence because when things are messy, when things don't get done, when there's ugly compromise, if that's all people see, they're gonna get super dispirited. But if you do a good job of celebrating the moments where you actually got something done, um, that can inspire some confidence. And, um, you know, I think that the great thing about that is you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money to do that. You just take out your phone and reach your audience. Uh, that's the last thing I'd say. Uh, and this is a global phenomenon. You just had a great election. You've got people who are now going to get office for the first time. I would humbly suggest that you remind them, and I'm sure the Institute will do a good job of this, that like all that communicating and good language and good message you did in the campaign, don't stop doing it in office. <laughs> I mean, even Barack Obama, as talented as he was, would be like, that was the stuff we did in the campaign. I'm governing now. I got, like, big decisions to make. It's like, yeah, you do. But, boy, if you don't take a minute to communicate, you know, in a smart way and bring people along, and we got into big trouble for that because we were doing too much. We weren't taking time to do the storytelling around it, and it didn't make sense to people. And so... Uh, that's something I think that, that is really important is to help your people going into office for the first time. That doesn't mean it's like a permanent campaign. That's not what I'm suggesting. Just those skills of communicating and using social media and reaching out to people. Just because you're in the halls of power doesn't mean you still can't communicate with people. And I think this is a problem all over the globe. And I just think this is where your staff can be important, which is have staff. So as you as an elected official don't have to be worrying about it happening. You have, you have trust that people are going to get it done. To remind you, uh, David, Governor Ridwan Kamil yeah. is sometimes called the king of social media. Yeah. If you follow his uh, yeah. Instagram, I think you will be the next, what, 15 million? How, much, how he, many followers? 22 he, million he followers. He does this well, yes. Yeah, so so he does his job communicating very well. No, you're a great <laughs> model in that regard, yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, before I go to the... By the way, a lot of people would pay a lot of money for 22 million Instagram followers. <laughs> well, about democracy, I just want to remind us all to what uh, once said by Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Democracy is, an, is not an ideal choice. It might be the worst kind of government, <laughs> but compare it to the rest. <laughs> That's what he said. Well, it means that you know, for all the advanced and rich countries now that has been there for... Uh, many years, not only 40 years like China, all of them are democratic and open society. So that's a very good lesson from history. Well, let me just say one thing. As you know, there are some things unique about America, many positive things. But one of the things that's unique in a negative way is our epidemic of mass shootings. Now, this is where you can... So, as, as tribal as our politics is, what do you think the percent of American people who agree that we should ban assault weapons is? Anybody? 90. 90. Yet at this point, it looks like we'll never do it. We just had another mass shooting yesterday at a sporting event celebration. So this is where Ridwanek can get, because, you know, lives are being lost. The country agrees, and our, and our democracy is gumming up the works. But... But at the end of the day, um, you have to have faith. Um, 
you know, that you can make progress. Because basically, if, if I think if people are told what to do and they don't feel like they're a part of it, you know, you only have to be a casual student of history to know that forms of governments and empires don't last forever. And particularly the ones that are more authoritarian, they may look impenetrable until one day they're not. Right? China is one successful autocracy that people rarely understand the complete story. But let me remind us all that there are more failed autocracies <laughs> than successful autocracy. So that's, that's why Golkar learns our lesson, and now we are participating, and we are the supporter, and we are at the forefront of transformation of the country into more mature democracy. Uh, Mr. Excellency from Ukraine, he used to be the, yeah. the ambassador for Ukraine. Maybe, Pak Acha, is this the last question? Because I know time is pressing. We are still counting votes. I know many people, gentlemen and ladies here, are anxious about their votes. So I'll make it. Okay. So one from uh, Excellency, one for Pak Samsuar is a governor of Riau, one of the stronghold of Golkar. Thank you, dear Dr. Rizal Maralangeng, for this opportunity. David, thanks for your point of view. Okay, sorry, Pak pa Samsuar and Pak Ijek. Uh, one governor of Riau and one aspiring governor of North Sumatra. Okay. Again, thanks for this opportunity for me to uh, have my command. Actually, I don't have any question anymore to you, David. I would like to appreciate our high appreciation for your point of view to see the result of the Indonesian democracy today for our election. And to answer uh, what kind of our chairman asking to you that what we should do on the next five, five more years election 2029, that's thanks for your humble suggestion to us that we have to listen to the footer. What's kind of behind that decision to make the Golkar now rebound since the fourth decade of the election before. This is, I think, the highest uh, result uh, led by uh, Mr. Erlanga as the chairman of the Golkar. Now we are have a chance to celebrate on this time. We are very lucky to be to be for being here today. My opinion is uh, why Golkar has a high result on this election. Does it because of the cocktail effect on the presidential election or what? In my opinion, this is because the effective of the leadership in Golkar, the strong leadership in Golkar who decide who the people, the candidate to put in yeah. every district of election. This is our strategy. So the Golkar have the political mission. It's very strong. And we have an experience. No matter who is the president, from or not from the Golkar, Golkar, string, uh, Golkar still uh, the strong uh, political party. Uh, that's my opinion. And again, thanks for your humble suggestion to us. Thank you, David. We listen to the questions first yeah, and sure. then you can answer. Pak Samsuar? Pak Samsuar? Bahasa Indonesia aja nanti saya. Ini karena salah satu yang paling tinggi sekarang ini dari Riau. Bisa sampai 30% nih. Yeah. <laughs> Ya, terima kasih Pak. Kami senang hari hari ini mendengar uh, penjelasan dari <laughs> ya Mr. David. Saya mohon bahasa Indonesia aja. Ya, lepas, lepas saya uh, memang saya ini karena pernah jadi bupati dua periode, pernah jadi gubernur baru satu periode. Sekarang ditugaskan oleh Pak Ketum jadi calon anggota legislatif. Dari pengalaman saya berbeda sekali nih antara pilkada yang telah pernah saya ikuti berkali-kali dengan caleg. Sebab di dalam, mungkin di Amerika tak ada seperti ini. Artinya perbedaannya kalau dalam rangka pemilihan caleg ini kita bersaing bukan dengan partai lain tapi kita bersaing juga dengan partai kita sendiri. Kadang-kadang ini yang paling momen dalam sejarah karir saya dalam politik. <laughs> karena saya ini dulu basicnya bukan bukan asli politik, karena saya dulu awalnya dari pegawai negeri, dari ASN. Jadi, tapi setelah saya masuk politik, 
yang paling berat saya menghadapi adalah pada waktu kami mengikuti pilek. Mungkin pilpres mungkin tidak berat. Tinggal bagaimana kita meyakinkan masyarakat agar pilihan kita terhadap presiden ini tidak salah. Dan itu itu yang kami buat di dalam rangka kami untuk menarik minat masyarakat agar mereka memilih presiden yang kita percaya. Tetapi pada waktunya kita saat ini berhadapan dengan pemilu legislatif, istilah kami bahasa, bahasa ini dalam bahasa Indonesianya ini sulit sekali, macam kita menarik rambut dalam tepung. Takut berserak. Coba salah-salah kalau kita nanti bersaing kita sama-sama kita, nanti pada akhirnya juga akan merugikan partai kita sendiri, yang pada akhirnya partai lain yang menguntungkan. Ini barangkali mungkin Baik. Pak yang sedikit kami nanti sampaikan pengalaman kami. Dan dari situlah sekarang ini karena memang apa yang telah diutus oleh DPP bahwa semua caleg ini bekerja maksimal sehingga Provinsi Riau sekarang ini termasuk tertinggi dalam rangka untuk meningkatkan kepercayaan kepada Partai Gokar. Terima kasih. Baik, terima kasih. Sekali lagi kita tepuk tangan Pak Sansuar nih. Ini kita lihat lagi lihat quick count, mungkin salah satu pemenang tertinggi perolehan Partai Golkar Provinsi adalah mungkin di Riau mendekati atau melewati 30% suara. Mantap Pak Sansuar. Baik, Pak Ijek. Pak Ijek mana tadi? Ah, sorry Pak Ijek. Sorry, ini udah agak tua di mata jadi nggak terlalu tajam. Silakan Pak Ijek. Baik. Terima kasih Pak Rizal. Mohon maaf saya bahasa Indonesia ya, juga nih Rizal. Ya, saya, saya jelasin. Uh, thank you Mr. David. Pertama saya mengucapkan terima kasih dulu buat Ketua Umum Pak Erlangga Hartarto. <tuk> Karena keberhasilan kita, kami Sumatera Utara tak terlepas dari Pak Erlangga Hartarto sebagai pimpinan Partai Golkar dengan jiwa besarnya. Kita tahu beliau harus saya ikut dari kandidat mau melepaskan, mundurkan diri untuk kepentingan yang lebih besar, tapi Allah balaskan dengan keadaan kita hari ini. Kedua, kaitan dengan uh, Mr. David, cerita tentang bagaimana politik dan demokrasi baik di Amerika ataupun melihat di Indonesia yang baru sekarang selesai election, pemilihan presiden dan juga pemilihan uh, legislatif. Uh, saat ini saya juga baru pertama pengalaman mengikuti pileg dan saya juga baru selesai periode yang lalu sebagai kepala daerah tapi sebagai wakil gubernur. Dan juga pengalaman pertama, sebelumnya saya pengusaha yang tidak punya basic politik dan tidak pernah ikut di partai politik manapun. Pada saat election kepala daerah juga saya tidak kader partai. Setelah menjadi wagub baru menjadi kader partai dan partai yang uh, saya masuk adalah Partai Golkar. Kenapa? Pada waktu itu juga banyak partai yang menawarkan, karena saya sudah menjadi wagub pada waktu itu, tapi saya memilih Golkar, karena saya lihat Golkar partai yang betul-betul kaderisasinya jelas dan pemiliknya adalah kader, bukan seseorang. Tapi setelah berjalan ini, saya melihat uh, fenomena mungkin juga di Amerika apakah sama atau tidak yang saya ingin tanyakan. Banyak anak-anak muda sekarang ini umur usia generasi muda itu lebih 50 persen pemilih di Indonesia. Tapi yang kita lihat kenyataannya terutama di daerah, apalagi di daerah kabupaten, kota sampai pedesaan, banyak anak-anak muda itu tidak suka berpolitik. Yang menurut saya ini sangat sangat tidak baik karena regenerasi ini harus berjalan. Dan politik ini harus juga tetap ada orang-orang yang menggantikan yang memang berpolitik bukan untuk kepentingan pribadi tapi adalah untuk kepentingan daerah, bangsa, dan negara. Saya selalu sampaikan pada saat kemarin kampanye-kampanye, mau tidak mau suka tidak suka politiknya akan lima tahun sekali akan ada election. Kalau kita tidak ikut di dalamnya, kita akan merugi karena kita tidak bisa hanya sebagai penonton. Kita kalau mau merubah sesuatu sebagai pemain. Yang saya tanyakan, bagaimana konsep dari Mr. David tentang anak-anak muda apakah di Amerika supaya mereka tertarik berpolitik dengan, dengan politik yang benar, bukan politik kepentingan. Baik, terima kasih, Mr. David. Well, I would say on the first of all on the comment that running for governor is different than legislature. Of course, yes. 
family fights are always hard because you're <laughs> and you're dealing with more candidates. And listen, you have successful governors in this room, so I think you know this. But it, it's always worth repeating that what voters are looking for in executive is different than in a legislator. They want strength, they want certainty, they want an agenda. And so as you look for gubernatorial candidates, sometimes people who are strong governor's candidates would also be strong legislative candidates. But oftentimes, that's not the case. Because executive offices require voters, I think, take that election very seriously. Because that person is not just involved in debates, they're making decisions. I think with young voters, so first of all, I'd say my sense, and you know, I don't have as much experience as you do with this question, but Golkar seems like it's got something pretty special going on with young people, particularly as a party that was seen as from the past, right? And so I think it's really important to highlight young candidates and young activists in social media so young people see people just like them. And secondly, I think one of your benefits is you are seen, I believe, as a, as a very mer uh, meritocratic party. And that is very um, important to young people, which is if you can be seen as the party that's open to anyone, whatever your faith, whatever your age, whatever your region, and not only are we open to you, you can move up because we're... Uh, a meritocracy, important. But I think the most important thing for young voters is you need to um, start by saying, I know you're cynical, or I know you think this may not matter. I think a lot of candidates make the mistake of just speaking to them. You got to meet people where they are, right? So let me give you a, a, a you like Joe Biden is going to have a really hard time getting the support from young people he needs. But what he has to do, I think, is to say, I get you're not excited that I'm running. <laughs> or by this race. That's hard for someone to say that. But meet people where they are and tell young people, I understand you may not think this matters, but let me tell you why it does. But then, of course, with social media, with Ridwan's 22 million followers and on TikTok and on X, those people are such powerful influencers and validators. And if they say, I met this candidate, and I'm going to get involved, or I like what they said about this issue. That's actually going to be more powerful than you saying it a hundred times. So you want to think about young people as the validators, because as you know, I've got younger uh, kids who are voters. They don't want to listen to anything anybody my age says. But if they hear it from a peer, they'll believe it, right? Now, I think your cynicism with young people here is not as pronounced in the United States. But it's there. So I think the best way to connect with people is to meet them where they are and say, I understand you may roll your eyes at this stuff. To Ridwan's question, you know, democracy can take a long time and there's too much compromise. But let me tell you how I'm going to try and improve your life. The other reason I think it's really important to have younger candidates and younger people in office is people you know, of a certain age, it's impossible for them to understand the wants, needs, and desires of someone who's 60 years younger than they are. You know, even in my party in America, Democrats, I think, have, a, have the better economic solution. But they'll often talk about the economy as it's 1950. And it's changed. People, for the most part, who are young don't want nor expect to work for one company. They expect to have seven different careers. They expect to be able to move around the world. But we talk about the economy still as like, you're going to have one employer. And so I think that understanding the hopes and desires of young people is so important if you're going to communicate with them. Because if you talk to them in a way that seems disconnected from the reality that they're living, they rightfully will tune you out, right? And you're clearly not going to do that because you're very focused on it. But I would just start by acknowledging where they are. Um, but it's also really important for young people, if you get elected and you accomplish something that you think young people will support, you've got to go back and report to them, right? And say why it matters. 
Uh, and I, I think that this is, listen, I think your party has an opportunity to build, because I think this is one of the things you're going to see in your after election analysis, is part of the reason you grow is you did better with young people than you had previously. So that is, I mean, that's the most valuable currency in politics. You are growing with the fastest part of the electorate that's growing. So how do you capitalize on that? But I think that we have to, you know, voters, okay, I'm, young people just have a very sensitized bullshit meter. You know, you can't speak to them the same way you talk to someone who's 45 or 50. They're just going to be more dubious. And, and so I think that, you know, engaging with them with that kind of respect, I think is important. On that note, maybe we want to close, but I want to introduce you. Oh, one more. Okay, Ibu, Ibu Irene from uh, province of yeah. Banten. Last question, ya, Ibu. Yeah. Yeah. Please, Ibu. Baik, terima kasih, Pak. Uh, saya Airin, uh, pernah menjabat sebagai wali kota Tangerang Selatan 2011 sampai dengan 2021. Saya juga ketua DPD Golkar di tingkat kota Tangerang Selatan yang merupakan suburb bagian uh, berbatasan dengan DKI Jakarta, mayoritas masyarakatnya perkotaan dan juga ada yang ruralnya. Yang ingin saya tanyakan, semoga kami pulang dari sini dan Terima kasih Pak Erlangga, memang luar biasa Golkar ini sebetulnya. Kenapa Pak Erlang, kenapa Golkar bisa urutan kedua insya Allah pertama? Karena leadership dari Pak Erlangga. Salah satunya adalah di mana kami yang mau maju pilkada gubernur wajib diharuskan untuk maju dulu sebagai anggota legislatif. Kayak Pak Ijek, Pak Samsuar, saya juga harus maju dulu sehingga kami berjuang untuk bisa mendapatkan suara partai dan juga rekomendasi. Terima kasih Bapak. Yang ingin saya tanyakan, pulang dari sini karena judulnya Pak Erwin, menyongsong pilkada 2024. Mau bulan September atau bulan November, pilkadanya serentak. Mulai dari tingkat provinsi, gubernur, dengan bupati wali kota. Persyaratan untuk maju sebagai gubernur dan bupati wali kota hasil pemilu legislatif 2024, 14 Februari kemarin. Strategi apa yang Bapak bisa kasih kepada kami Pak David? sehingga kami nanti mungkin selebrasinya hanya seminggu dua minggu saja udah gitu bagi calon gubernur calon bupati wali kota harus turun lagi ke lapangan berjuang lagi untuk pilkada tentunya yang belum tentu saya Pak Ijek Pak Samsuar dilantik gitu ya Pak ya mudah-mudahan sih ngerasain dulu dua bulan gitu kan Amin titip Pak Ketum mudah-mudahan kami bisa dilantik dulu siapa tuh dalam biodata oh jangan dilantik dulu Oh ya siap 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 Pak ya. Mudah-mudahan dalam CV jadi jadi pernah jadi anggota DPR gitu Pak Minimal. Kembali lagi ke Pak David. Bapak bisa bayangkan sistem pilkada di bulan November 2024 dengan aturan yang baru, undang-undang pilkada yang baru secara serentak. Gubernur, bupati, wali kota di hari yang bersamaan dipilih secara langsung. Bayangkan oleh Bapak, misalnya gubernur saya nyalon gubernur Banten. Yang mendukung saya adalah bukan hanya Golkar saja. Misalnya ada Gerindra di situ, ada PDIP di situ. Sedangkan ada empat kabupaten, empat kota, bupati wali kota yang dipilih dari Partai Golkar dengan koalisi yang berbeda. Ini rumitnya kayak apa, uyak-uyakannya kayak apa gitu. Pun nggak tahu bahasa, bahasa Inggrisnya uyak-uyakan apa, Pak. Jadi apa yang Bapak bisa berikan kepada kami sehingga dua minggu lagi saat kami turun ke lapangan memastikan bahwa koalisi partai pendukung mudah-mudahan bisa sama, paralel. Tapi kalaupun misalnya berbeda, karena kan hasil suara kursi di DPRD provinsi atau kabupaten kota kan akan berbeda. Maka apa yang harus kita lakukan, strategi apa yang harus kita lakukan, manakala gubernur maju, bupati wali kota maju. Saya membayangkan hanya empat kabupaten kota, kalau di wilayah provinsi Banten, nggak tahu Pak Ridwan Kamil, mau di, kalau di, di Jawa Barat dengan bupati wali kota yang sangat luar biasa besarnya seperti apa. Jadi intinya Pak David, berikan kami bekal, turun ke lapangan dua minggu lagi, apa yang harus kita lakukan sehingga Golkar bisa menang lagi dengan suara terbanyak di mana gubernur bupati wali kota berasal dari Partai Golkar. Terima kasih. Need a different kind of political party. So, it, what is it for governor? For governor or for president? Participating in the more complex. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Itu bah, bahasa Inggrisnya complexity. Jadi yeah. complex election. Siap, siap. <laughs> well, my my experience is, you know, it's when something is complex. Uh, I think what you want to do is just try and simplify it. In an election, we, it starts with, how many votes do I need? That's the North Star. A good campaign makes every decision. 
about spending money, spending time, message connected to that question. And so you work back from that. How can I acquire the number of votes that you and your team think it will require to win? Some of that's building coalitions. Some of it is spending more time in areas where you think you can actually maybe do better than Gold Car historically does. It means spending time in places where you're worried you might not do well enough. But I think at the end of the day, just try and simplify it. Here's how many votes I need. Here's who I am. Here's my story. Here's why I'm the right person for this job at this time. Here's who I'm going to fight for. And then how am I going to get that message out? How much of it is through social media and through interviews? How much of it's through advertising? And listen, money in politics matters just as it does in, in the private sector. Why? Because you can be sure you're getting the message to the person you need to get it to at the time you need to get it to them, right? I do a lot of work in the private sector, and even those companies sometimes will be like, ah, I don't want to spend money on advertising for that. Then fine, don't get your message out. <laughs> like, I, that's the choice, right? So, so that allows you to control what you can control, which is there's this set of voters that I want to communicate with about, could be transportation and roads, could be jobs, and I'm going to do good content and reach them. Um, and understand what kind of coalition you need to build and who needs to be speaking on your behalf. Because of course, when we say something about ourselves, it's always less powerful than when someone else says it about us. And so to build up kind of an army of people who are saying, this is why you should win. This is a great idea. But I think at the end of the day, it's hard for a candidate. You have so many people saying, you should go here. You should do that. You should say it this way. And good candidates listen, but honestly, only to a degree. Because otherwise, you're just running around uh, kind of recklessly. Like, I actually think the most important word in politics, and this is going to sound arrogant, but, but I mean it, is no. Because if you say yes to everything, you're not prioritizing, right? So it's like, this is how many votes we need. This is our sense of how we're going to get them. Here's our message. Here's who important to me politically. Here's how we're going to get our message out. And honestly, anything that doesn't contribute to that is no. By the way, this is where staff comes in, because sometimes the candidate doesn't want to tell someone important no. So a good thing a candidate can do is, I made the decision not to manage my schedule. My staff does that for me. Like, by the way, that's what Barack Obama did. Because he's a wonderful person, but he did not like to say no to people. So people like me would say no. He'd love to do it, but he can't. And then they take out their frustration on the staff, not on you. So I really encourage that. But, but the sounder and simpler plan you have, then it helps decision making. And I'm not suggesting it's not complex and there won't be challenges and, and you won't have to adjust it a little bit. But at the end of the day, I and I have done this myself, you overcomplicate politics. At the end of the day, there's some math, and there's some message, and there's some messengers, and there's resources. And you're not dealing like a consumer company is with all the consumers. It's just a small percentage of somebody in a province or a district. So it's actually a manageable universe of people to reach. So that would be my advice. Um, but make sure you have a good team around you who's going to also not complicate things for you, <laughs> right? Uh, campaigns are hard enough, but when the team is adding complexity and uncertainty and, and bad and, and inconsistent decision-making, it's awful, you know, so. Okay, see, give applause to David, please. Yeah. She, asked, she asked that question because she really wants to win. We can see from her face. She will win, David. I guarantee you she will win. <laughs> Now, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the message from David is very simple. Make your life and your campaign simple. Campaigning is hard enough. Make it simple. That's a good, get, that's a good question. Now, uh, David, do you have a last, last note for us to... No, just it was great being with all of you. Um, it's always good to be in a room with people who had a positive election. There's no feeling like it. 
Um, and uh, it'll be really exciting to see how you build on that, um, you know, in, in the years to come. So uh, thanks for allowing me to be in your country and, and being here today. And good luck to all of you. And I, a special shout out to the candidates. It takes a lot to put yourself out there. Um, and if you win, the prize you get, to Ridwan's point, is sometimes ugly and frustrating. But you're there to serve people. So, uh, you know, you, you make our, our world and our society and all of our country stronger because too few people are making the decision to offer themselves up, you know, and expose themselves and spend time away from their friends and families. And then if you win, you work around the clock too. And you got a lot of people unhappy with the decisions you make. So it, it takes a special person to do that. So thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you once more. Thank you, Pak Erwin, for organizing the forum. Pak Acha, Pak Erlangga, thank you for coming. Everybody from North Sulawesi, from Sulawesi, from Sumatra. When are you coming back to Jakarta again? All right. Well, all right. Thank you. Anyway, say hello to everybody in your. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, terima kasih, saya kembalikan ke Panitia. Oke, okay, ladies and gentlemen, give applause to David Plouf and Dr. Rizal Malarangeng. Uh, let's take a photograph together, Board of Leaders of Golkar. Oh, di sini. Oh ya, oke. David, let's take a picture. Silakan. Again, let us give applause to David Plouf and Dr. Rizal Malarangeng. Okay, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to an end, and please feel free to stay for coffee break and further discussion. Thank you. Ayah Razi Sabardi, close this session. Thank you.